Hello everyone, let's go ahead and take a look at Euler's form of a complex number. Now, we know certain forms of a complex number, say for example the Cartesian form, as well as the polar form. And the information that's needed in order to get a complex number in its Cartesian form, of course, is the real part of Z and the imaginary part of Z. And for the polar form, we need to know what the argument of Z is and the modulus of Z in order to come up with Z is equal to R6 theta. Now, Euler's form is the new form that we're going to introduce today. And that's going to be z is equal to r e to the i theta. Now, again, take a look at the information that's needed. And what you should notice is the information needed in order to get a polar form of a complex number is exactly the same information that you need to get that same complex number into its Euler's form. Now, let's take a look at an example here just to make sure that we can piece all, the thing, all of these together because all of these are equivalent forms of a particular uh, complex number. And let's say, for example, that z is going to be equal to 2 plus 2i, which is a Cartesian form. The modulus, of course, is going to be the root 8. And the argument of that particular uh, complex number is going to be pi over 4. So we can rewrite that Cartesian form of a complex number into its associated polar form. And again, we can go ahead and rewrite this now in its associated Euler's form, which is the square root of 8 e to the i times pi over 4. Now, a couple of things that we should notice is that being that the information needed for both the polar form and the Euler's form is exactly the same, we can go ahead and equate those forms together and come up with cis theta. Cis theta is equal to e to the i theta. Also notice that if we go ahead and take a look at the, uh, the properties of the polar form of a complex number when multiplied together, we'll see consistency if we do the same operation in Euler's form. So for example, cis alpha times cis beta is going to be cis of alpha plus beta. The Euler's form of cis alpha is going to be e to the i alpha. Cis beta is going to have its Euler form to be e to the i beta. Multiply those two together and we come up with e to the i alpha plus i beta. Factor out the i's and you got alpha plus beta. And therefore we have consistency between the polar and Euler's form of a complex number when you multiply two of them together. Now the quotient of course cis alpha divided by cis beta is going to give us cis alpha minus beta. And of course we can go ahead and take a look at the associated Euler's form given the same quotient, and notice that we'll have consistency there with the arguments. So, very important to notice that we have consistency. Now, what's the merit of Euler's form? Well, if we wanted to go ahead and say, for example, evaluate 3 to the i, we've never really come across that kind of situation before, because usually when we deal with exponentials, the exponent is always going to be a real number. But in this case, it's an imaginary number, so how do we deal with that? Well, the one thing that we need to recognize is that 3 is equal to e to the natural log of 3. Therefore, we can go ahead and write 3 to the i is the same thing as e to the natural log of 3 raised to the i power. Given that the case, we can go ahead and write that as e to the i natural log of 3. And what you should notice is that this is not Euler's form. Now, I can't really do much with that, so I'm going to change Euler's form into its associated polar form and just say that that's going to be cis natural log of 3. Now, if I wanted to go ahead and find out what the Cartesian form of that is, that's just going to be the cosine of the natural log of 3 plus i sine natural log of 3. And of course, you can go ahead and use your calculator to determine what those irrational values are. So, we can now go ahead and evaluate an exponential with the complex unit or the complex number in the exponent location. So let's go ahead and wrap up again. Euler's form of a complex number is going to be very similar in terms of what information is you need in order to go ahead in a, in a polar form in order to generate its associated Euler's form. And if we can go ahead and recognize, hopefully we can recognize that the, the consistency that we have when we apply the properties to the polar form as well as to Euler's form, and also notice that there are specific values that we will not be able to go ahead and evaluate because now we can associate Euler's form with the polar form, which we can then go ahead and change into the Cartesian form to come up with simplified complex numbers. 
So we'll take a look at some even further examples in class the next time that we meet. See you then. Bye-bye.